Welcome to Wealth Matters Podcast. I have with me Mr. Bob Fraser. Uh, he's the founder and principal of Aspen Funds. Uh, and Bob has purchased more than 1,000 mortgage notes, earning double-digit annual returns without the risk and volatility of traditional investing options. By purchasing discounted residential real estate notes in the American heartland they discovered a high yield, liquid, asset secured investment that produced consistently superior returns without all the risk. Better yet, they could work with homeowners to help them stay in their home. Everyone wins. Welcome, Bob. It's great to be here with you. Same here. You know, I'm excited so, to be with someone who came from tech background, and we'll talk about that because. You know, I, I'm from tech background as well and moved into real estate. So I'm okay. looking forward to this discussion. <laughs> yeah, me too. So tell my listeners about something which we don't know, like something really interesting about yourself. <laughs> well, I'm a pretty boring guy, but uh, uh, how about I have uh, seven granddaughters and no grandsons. So. <laughs> oh, Wow. <laughs> No, that, that's good. And I, I love daughters. I got two daughters. So, yeah. <laughs> it's just that we rarely get a chance to speak, right? <laughs> uh, that's good. So, how and when did you start in real estate? How early did I get started in real estate? Yeah, how and when? You were, well, I actually got started uh, just with Aspen about eight eight years ago. So okay. my background is pretty much tech, and uh, and I ran a hedge fund for a while. Did a did ran a tech business for a while. Um, I did I did buy a single condo for rental real estate, and it was it was a disaster. So I'm allergic <laughs> to real estate. I know a lot of people make a lot of money in there. Uh, not me. Um, so I I. I made every mistake you can make and I hate rental real estate. Um, so, but I love notes. So we, I, I, be, I decided that, or I figured out that being a lien Lord is a whole lot better than being a landlord. Yeah. And, uh, so for me, it's way better. Yeah. I mean, so you are on the other side, you are the bank, right? And, and banks, the bank. yeah, yeah. They don't lose money. I don't. <laughs> no. Yeah. So, so tell us, this is interesting and I, I, you know, I want to relate to this myself and, and basically see your story. So from tech, well, what did you do in tech and how did you end up in, with hedge funds? Well, I, uh, I was a computer programmer uh, for years. I graduated in computer science from UC Berkeley. Uh, oh, right here. Okay, I'm yeah, in San Francisco. Yeah, Bay, yeah. <laughs> and I loved computer programming. I was super talented at it and um, did a lot of cutting edge work and I just, I loved it and then started a tech business, a tech startup. I had an idea, you know, in 1995 and started. Perfect timing. <laughs> exactly. You know, good timing is, is really a gift, right? Uh, yes. you know, as I, as I say, you know, uh, you know, you want to know what time it is, you know, it, it, when the tide comes in, all boats float, right? Yes. When the tide's out, all boats sink. Yeah. Then, then you're know, naked, right? Starting <laughs> a dot com business in the late nineties is a good idea, you know. Even if you have a bad idea, it's going to yeah, be. Yeah, it's it's like right now, right? <laughs> Last five years. <laughs> yeah, so, so actually, I became passionate about understanding timing and understanding oh, okay. what what the macroeconomic picture is. So I've I've become a a you know a student of economics. I've been writing an economic newsletter for many years. Because I, I don't want to fight the tides. I want to know what the tides are doing. And when the right. tides are with you, you can make mistakes and you'll be fine. And yes, yes. No, and, that's, a, that's a great point. When the tides are against you, it doesn't matter you can't what, do it. how smart you are and how right yeah. you are. You're going to really struggle. Yeah, and, you know, and, and we know about, uh, you know, Netscape and, you know, MySpace and Alta, uh, <laughs> right? Yeah, so, so I started a, a business in my attic with my sister-in-law in 1995 raised a hundred thousand dollars from mom wow. you know, thank God for mom and it blew up we ended up having 300 employees raised 44 million dollars in venture capital wow. and became the fastest growing business in the midwest region of the united states in the late 90s by revenue we were doubling in size about every three months doubling revenues at one period and um, so it just really blew up and uh and then i ended up winning the ernst young entrepreneur of the year award 
hired all these, you know, all, all these, you know, well-heeled uh, resumes and super talented managers. And, and what happened through that, I kind of got an education in, uh, in finance and really, really have a passion for finance and economics. So, so I started really working as a CFO after that, you know, and, uh, um, you know, and uh, became a professional investor for a while and then, uh, and then, then started Aspen. Nice. So uh, tell us about your newsletter, regard, uh, the economic newsletter. I, I would like to subscribe. <laughs> yeah, well, we, we basically do right now, it, it, the way we do that is uh, we, I do a quarterly update, a, economic update. I've been doing this for, you know, I don't know, many, many years. And um, uh, mm -hmm. we send that to our investor base, um, but also to, you know, we do make it public. Um, and if you're interested, you can go to aspenfunds.us, which is our website, and uh, and I believe it's posted there. Um, and we can give it to your to your uh, to your listeners in the show notes. Um, That's awesome. But yeah, I, it's it's you know, it has not it has not uh, led me astray. Um, you know, I I basically pay a lot of it. I do real economic analysis, and the news is not your friend. The news right. always <laughs> tell you what's right, and and you need to look at the numbers. So I go and do research. I look at the numbers. I've I've said you know since 2013, I said real estate is gonna be uh, is gonna be the major winner. Um, since 2013, I literally pinged the bottom of the market. Uh, I, I I in the early early 2011, I believe I, I said this, the, the great recession or this real estate recession was, was going to last six years, which is exactly what it did all based on, on research that I'd done. And, and, uh, and it's all been true. So I said, inflation is going to stay low for, for, you know, for the foreseeable future. Um, and so made a number of predictions that have actually proven out uh, quite true. And if you act on them quite lucrative. So so, uh, you know, and it's in the, you know, with COVID, I just, I predicted, I, I said, we're, it's not going to be V-shaped recovery goods, but it's going to be close. And, you know, again, all based on, on different, different research that I had done. So, and it's all, it's all proving out, you know, I right. was very concerned that they didn't do the, if they had not done the stimulus. Oh and yes. That, that was huge. Stimulus, we, would, we would be, we would be getting ready for great depression. Right. And, right. Um, and, uh, you know, same thing in 2009. So a lot of people are predicting hyperinflation, a lot of people, but it, they're just, they're wrong on, uh, you know, so uh, I, I look at data and, you know, I, I'm one of those guys, because I'm a computer scientist, right? I don't, I don't really care about opinions, including my own, you know, right. <laughs> I really care about data and facts and, uh, yep. you know. Got it. So uh, tell us about, you mentioned lean lord. What is a lean lord and how does that work? You know, because I'm a landlord, right? So, but I do know. So can you explain it to my I, listeners? I, I pity you and all those, all those poor landlords who, uh, who have to answer the calls at midnight and the plumbing and fine renters and all that, but um, discover termites. So all that happened to me, but um, anyhow, a lien lord, as you pointed out, is the bank. Um, when is the last time you called your bank when your plumbing failed? Um, you know, so so being a being a lien lord is the bank. So instead of somebody pay, you know sending us rent, you know our 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 borrowers are their their uh, borrowers, their homeowners will borrow, and they send us mo monthly mortgage payments. So we get the cash flow. And uh, and none of the headaches. So how do you start buying notes, right? Because I'm always, uh, you know, fascinated about it. And, and there are a lot of ways, you know, you can, of course, use sites like Paperstack. And there are a lot of other sites, too. Paperstack's uh, a great choice. We actually sell notes through Paperstack. So. Oh, okay, okay. So there's a, there's a great choice. They have a good process, you know. Um, you know, you need to do your due diligence. Um, you know, and, uh, but they're very lucrative. So how do you buy in bulk, right? Let's, let's just say if someone wants to really grow, uh, do you work with banks, credit unions? How, how does that work? What's the process? Almost all these are come through different relationships that we have, um, primarily hedge fund sources. So 
a lot of, a lot of uh, you know, we have two strategies, but I'm gonna talk about our reperforming fund where we buy performing notes. So these are, these are people that maybe they had trouble a while back, but now they're paying, maybe right. they have a loan modification and they're back on track. It's working, they're sending them monthly payments, so, so these are these are good notes. These are this is good paper. And, and sorry to interrupt. So, uh, non-performing are where the you know t- you know the borrower is not paying, right? Nothing and and not, performing not. are where they are paying. And re-performing is they had some yes, issues exactly. and now they are back on track. And, and and we buy both, but I'm going to talk about this re-performing strategy. So we buy them, but we we buy them at a discount. Right. And, and so we generally buy them from hedge funds that reperform them. So they buy non-performing notes, they get the borrowers back on track, and then they, they flip the notes out once they repair the note. Well, we'll buy those. Um, so primarily our, our sources are hedge funds and okay. uh, who, who basically have repaired the notes. And we, we get them at a discount. We, we love, I would rather own a second mortgage than a first mortgage. Again, defies traditional logic. Really? And, uh, yeah, because I have been like told, you know, of, of course, took, took some, uh, you know, note classes uh, from Addy Speed, right? And I have been told that you want to start with only the first mortgage. So why, okay. why do you prefer that's, second that's mortgage? Great. I love that because you leave those for me and I can make all the money. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. That's great. You know, and, and it just shows there's so many ways to make money and Eddie Speed's not wrong. I mean, there's, there's, there's money to be made there, right. but I'll tell you why I love seconds. Okay. So let's say there's a $300,000 house mm-hmm. and it has a hundred thousand dollar first, first lien paying 3%. Right. Okay. And it has a hundred thousand dollar second lien that's paying 8%. Right, always it's higher, right? <laughs> okay, so it's always higher. Well, and a lot of cases it's more than double. Right. Okay. And so if I were to buy that hundred thousand dollar first scene lien, I would probably have to pay a hundred thousand dollars for it. Or really close. Oh, right. And my yields would be maybe my yields would be three, four. Maybe if I could yeah. just count my yields would be four. Okay. And if I foreclose, I would get, if that something happened, I would get a hundred percent of my capital back fine, but I make no yield. Now if I bought a second. Well, believe it or not, that second mortgage is going to sell. I could buy that hundred thousand dollar second mortgage for, let's say, sixty thousand dollars. Okay, okay, and, so and sorry to interrupt again. So that the coupon rate is eight. I'm actually making thirteen uh, percent. Oh, year. I see. So I get a yield. Okay, but that's not even the best part. Okay, not even the best part is getting these great yields. You want to know the best part of having a second? Of house? course. <laughs> okay, it's when he sells or refinances that house. Oh, so he really? Gets a new loan. Both those liens are paid off, right? Yes. And I get I get a hundred thousand right. dollars to pay off my loan, but I only paid sixty for it, so I make right. a forty thousand. Profit. Yeah, the huge so, lump sum. Yes, I want to. I want to do a deal with you, Alpesh. You buy all the first and leave all the second. <laughs> okay, and uh, so you can earn your four percent, three percent, and I will earn my fourteen plus a kicker. So, but what happens? And again, this is what I have heard. Right, if that person forecloses, right, most of the time you end up foregoing the second lien. That's what. I've heard this first lien gets the precedence. Okay, well, who forecloses, okay? So you're, you're saying, let's say, here's the scenario I believe you're painting. So the, the, the borrower stops paying both notes. Mm-hmm. Is that the scenario? Yep. Okay, so the first mortgage forecloses. Right. All right, well, so that home sells at a discount for $220,000 and I sit back and collect you know, it, the first loan is going to get first money out. Second lien gets a second money out. And then the, the homeowner is going to get whatever less. And in that case, I would do absolutely nothing. And I would collect my $100,000 payoff. Right. But okay, let's now, say it's let's, already let's, underwater. Let's say, there's, <laughs> let's say it's, a, it's another scenario. Let's say, let's say he stops paying. Well, then I would initiate foreclosure before the first. So, and, and foreclosure is, is, a, is a legal collection action. Right. And, that point um now i basically would you know i control that real estate i can do a lot of things in fact one of the things that people don't aren't even aware of in most states i have i have a, i have reinstatement rights i can on the first mortgage so i can actually write a check 
every month to the first mortgage. Having on this. So after I foreclose, I keep that senior loan in place, even though oh. that borrower is no longer in the house. Wow. The borrower still owes the money, but he's not paying the money. I'm paying the money. So and it's, I'm it, it's bizarre, okay? But I've done it. I've so done it's, it. it's like subject to or something. Where in, in this yes. case, just and the borrower so hasn't I signed over. Financing. So I did this in Los Angeles with an $800,000 house. And had, a, had the senior mortgage in place while we basically rehab the property and I'm paying a monthly payment to a borrower that I, or to a lender that I do not know. <laughs> and the, what do they care? The check is coming right. in. Yeah. And then I flipped that thing out and made a, made a bundle of money and, and it cost me nothing, but really, you know? So, so worst case scenario, or, you know, with the truth is as a, as a, with a foreclosure, you can do a lot of things. So as a second, I would control the short sale. So you go, you can go find a, find a buyer, a wholesaler, if you like, um, you can, you can let it go at an auction. You can take control of the property and rehab it yourself. Uh, you can do a short sale. There's a whole lot of things you can do. So now it becomes a real estate play, but generally being a lean Lord is not a real estate play. Okay. I think, I think in, in my current, performing portfolio. I have about 500 loans right now, 500 notes. And I, I, I think I've taken possession of a property once. Wow. Um, so it's not that common. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's you know, rare. I've had, I've had of, of all, I think I have, uh, you know, maybe half a dozen non-performing notes, half a dozen in there um, that, you know, and, and I, I choose, I can foreclose, I can take possession of the property and let it go at auction. There's a lot of things you can do. But generally getting wiped is not is doesn't happen that often um and let's say the first let's say I've, i'm asleep and the first forecloses but as soon as i learn about it generally there's a notice requirement so when they when the first begins foreclosure notice of sale um you know notice of default notice of sale i get notified because if i'm on record you got to make sure you're, you're you're right of course well, recorded properly well at that point now i have an option so the first the first is foreclosing. One, I can do nothing. And if there's a lot of equity, that's what I do. I let it yeah. take the process, I get paid off. Now, if there's not a lot of equity, and I and I I believe that, you know, that I can make some money on this or that I can protect my position, I will I can have a couple choices. I can one bid at the auction with a protective bid, you know, so just to cover my cost basis or I see my profit objective. Okay, and let it go there. Now I may win. I may win. Win back the bid. Okay. At that point, my second lien is wiped out, and the first lien is in place. You follow I me? See. Yes. Okay. The third option. The third option I can do is I can reinstate the first. So I, as soon as I write a check to the first, that first foreclosure is canceled. Ah. Uh. And what does it change to me? It doesn't cost me anything. I just now increased my. I increased my cost basis, but I also increased my equity by this by this exact same right. amount. Follow me. So it's it, it it's it doesn't cost me anything really. It's it's cash flow, um, and then I initiate my own foreclosure. So if right. I I want to have my own foreclosure. I want to control the process um, because then I don't have to bid. So if I bid at auction, I have to come with a pile of cash. Generally, right. a reinstatement. A reinstatement, you know, cost me very little. Um, you know, twenty grand, thirty grand, fifty grand. Got it. So, so there's a lot of options you have, and attorneys, by the way, are they'll tell you all, walk you all through this. So <laughs> find, it, find a good attorney, and you know, it's not that big a deal. Right, because uh, mostly I've seen where, and I had an example where one of my friend, uh, he his property was worth half a mil. The first lien was three hundred something. The second was hundred. And, you know, uh, when the market crashed in California, the, now the property was worth 400, right? Uh, or little less than 400. He reached out the second lien that I'm going to just do a short sale. And Wells Fargo said, okay, yeah, you can, uh, you know, write us a check of 10 grand instead of 100 grand, which you owe us. And we'll forgo the second lien. And that's what they did. Wow. <laughs> Our guy, you know, I mean, timing yeah. is everything, you know. Yeah, and, that's what, and I'm like, wow, man. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we bought a bunch of second mortgages and the guy says, I was, I was offered, you know, 10, you know, I was, uh, this previous lender offered, you know, offered me $5,000 to wipe out this, this lien. And now you're telling me I should pay 50. I'm like, well, you should have taken it. You know? <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> you know? 
those are big banks you know they don't want to go through all and the process right they don't they, they, <laughs> don't they don't so yeah i mean that's just being being financially savvy you know you can you can definitely you know uh make sure you're you win you know and know what your options are at least so, so are you are you buying notes right now and and Absolutely. like which which markets uh, uh, do you prefer <laughs> Well, every market, every okay. market. Yeah. So, so you do not focus on certain states because I've heard that the laws are different in like New York, California, you know, some of the states. The How no, there's no such thing <laughs> as, a, as a bad loan. There's only a bad price. Okay. So, so I buy all over the United States, okay. but we do price things differently. So a, a New York loan, we discount it because it's got a you know three to four year foreclosure process and oh yes extremely difficult lender laws you know and right now with the covid there's a lot of covid delays that the courts are now forbearance yeah there's a lot delays yeah. everything yeah. and um so we we pay a lot of attention to that and it just changes the price we're willing to pay for the note i see so it depends by the state right when the price yeah, absolutely and and we look for a good note. We want to, we want to see a good borrower, but basically we, we treat them like hard money loans. So we look primarily at the property. We look at the asset and the encumbrances, and make a decision: is that the loan we want to own? And then against against the price, the the yield, and the and the the uh, long term payoff, the discount. You know, um, so it's purely a numbers game. Right. Yeah, and numbers don't lie. <laughs> so uh, one more question regarding your investment criteria like when you're looking at the note um, do you look at the UPB unpaid balance uh, is there a criteria the broker price opinion BPO is there a criteria absolutely Can we look at everything yeah it's a little bit more complicated than buying real estate okay oh, yes <laughs> okay because you have to do I have to do everything you would do for real estate underwriting Okay, you've got to you got to get the the broker price opinion. You need to look at the property, the market, and make sure this is in the in if if I end up getting this property as a property I can do something with or not. Mm. Um, number one, but then you add to that I need to I need to have understanding of the state. You know, is it a judicial or a or a non judicial state? Mm changes the time frames dramatically foreclosure time frames and what is the foreclosure costs and but all that's public you can get all that information um, and then and then uh, but now if you're buying a second you need to understand the, the first lien super important is that oh, really okay you know is it is this is this uh, you know what's the condition of the senior lien and what's the balance so if someone had a modif modification you can think they have a hundred thousand dollar loan when they actually have a two hundred thousand dollar loan Okay, so it makes a big uh, difference. What's ahead is you need to understand the the senior loan, and and uh, so we're we're experts at doing that. You know, figuring out, um, you know, what's the condition of the of the senior loan, and then the final thing is the borrower: are they likely to pay? Um, so, so can you talk about uh, one of your best deals so far? Sure. Um, well, let me see. We just we just. Uh, uh, we just had, we had a guy who we bought this loan. I, I, I think it was, uh, you know, 2014 and uh, we bought a loan. I think it was, he was, he was, we were earning about, uh, 14% uh, yield on oh, this. Oh, wow. Okay. It was, it was a second lien. He had, he, he was a mail carrier and he lost his job and I had some medical bills. And so he got off track. He got back on, back on track and, uh, he started paying again. We end up buying this note from him and he paid for four years, uh, I think $24,000 over the course of four years in principal and interest payments. And then he, he had, af after four years, had gotten enough of, you know, his financial life back on track. His credit score was good. He refinanced yeah, yeah. and paid us off. And we made another $20,000, $25,000 on a, I believe was a, you know, the note was a thirty thousand dollar note. Oh wow! Okay, <laughs> it was. We paid thirty grand for it, so we we did we did very well on that. And he wrote us this great letter and said, "Thank you very much for for taking care of me and you know and you know not kicking me out of my house and you know we're just everybody wins. We're happy. He's happy. That's awesome. What was your worst deal and what did you learn from it? 
Well, my, you know, my worst deal. Okay. I got, uh, I, I bought a loan in, um, it was in Mississippi and didn't understand that it's called the rocket docket state. You can actually foreclose. And I believe it's something like 60 days to foreclose. Oh, wow. Okay. And there's no noticing requirements. Fast. So really the first one. So that, so, so, we were getting paid. So the lady had the second mortgage on ACH. And oh. We, were getting, we had no idea something was wrong. Wow. And we were getting paid. All of a sudden, we, the payment stopped. We, we figured out the first foreclosed. They, had, they never, we would, had no noticing requirements. Right. And, um, and, uh, uh, and it was foreclosed in like 60 days, and we had no, we had no idea. So... So at, the, at that point, we, we basically dug a little deeper and, you know, understand that, hey, we, we, we want to do risk management and, and touch the senior note on a quarterly basis, at least to make, make sure everything is, even if everything seems good, but right. it was a $20,000 loss. So it was pretty much immaterial. Um, right. Yeah. You know, in the, in the scheme. In the grand things. scheme of things. Yeah. But, it, but it's still <laughs> it's just one of those things that just pisses you off you know right <laughs> you know, getting like 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 that and understanding that i mean the state laws are just so different from state right. state. understanding what your risks are when you're when you're buying that and uh you know so we learned about the rocket docket and uh how quick you can go to foreclosure and that there's no noticing requirements it's unbelievable really so normally i'm required to be served you know right that's interesting. So last question before we take a quick break. Do you only focus on single family notes or is it all over? We love single family. Okay. Love single. It's, it's part of my investment thesis. Um, you know, right now you're seeing massive cap rate compression on pretty, yes. every, pretty much every asset class, but not single family. If you look at single family, because of the, of the, the real estate crash, 2006 to 2000, you know, uh, 13 crash. Um, housing prices are massively underpriced, and and I I can I can give you that whole thesis another time. But why why single family homes are massively underpriced, and it's not true of pretty much every other real estate class. Okay? I see. So we definitely favor single family. But but do you think that uh, single family houses are still underpriced in coastal markets like New York? Yeah, well, and San Francisco, because yeah. it's it's been crazy here. <laughs> no, no, I, I I think there's some markets where I, I would I would say that's not. Yeah, not and they got to correct at some point because it's just unaffordable for you know common people. Yeah, well, but so is Tokyo, and so is I mean you know right and, London and yeah. city and urbanization is a relentless trend, and it's going to con going to continue. But here's some of the things I, I look at. I mean, there's been almost no new single family construction you know, since, since 2006. Okay. No new housing starts and single family housing starts and very, very few. And the reason is right for 15 years ago, you could buy a piece of land, you could build a house on it, yes. sell it and make money today. You can't do that. You, you, you can't do that. Why not? Inflation, inflation yes. so during the 14 years, inflation has continued on this relentless trend. Okay, but housing prices have not continued. They've they've gone. They did a massive crash, thirty five percent national average, and then have been trying to catch up. But they're still not even close. So the, basically, housing prices have not kept up with inflation. And the reason I know that is because if I bought a piece of land today, I built a house, I would sell it, I would lose money. Okay, yeah. because the cost has gone up lumber labor oh lumber's gone up like crazy yes. in the last six months even and, more than and, doubled <laughs> and so there's the problem so you've got no new no new supply right <laughs> prices are controlled by supply and demand yep. there's virtually no supply okay and 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 demand continues to grow because we have population growth right so, so we, you've got you've got demand increasing, supply decreasing. You have what we have now. You know, massive housing shortages. You know, and uh, bidding wars. You know, um, add a few other fundamentals. And like like the, one of the, our our favorites is you know price to rent ratios. Mm -hmm. You know, and in the Midwest region right now, I I can you know a principal I can buy a house. The principal and interest payment is half. 
equivalent rent I can rent that place for. Half. Yeah, that that's crazy. Like it's it's other way around here in my part of the world. That's, that and it's, that's, it's, it's that's double. Another sign, <laughs> another sign that it is that is underpriced. So so there's a lot of underpriced markets now. Now there are overpriced markets, and and you know where where the where the rents are half a principal and interest payment, and those I would not be buying it. Yeah, and but but uh, so based on a lot of valuation metrics you know we're very bullish on the housing price add add to the fact that you have you know record low mortgage rates and what and what's more they're going to continue low because the reason they're low is because the federal reserve is buying mortgages yeah, okay and, and then they don't have choice you know <laughs> they don't have, and guess what they're going to and next tick up they're going to buy more yeah. and the next tick up after that guess what they're going to do they're going to buy more mortgage rates yeah, or and, and, and print money <laughs> and and number number four you think about the negative interest rates happening in europe in asia you know um so if you're if you run a pension fund and you have a billion dollars and your billion euros sitting there and you're paying a bank you know uh, 10 million dollars a year to store your to store that you know what That's are you unheard do? of. <laughs> what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Well, you're going to do anything but that. Yeah, you got to invest. Very well. <laughs> you are going to take that money. You're going to buy a currency swap. Yeah. And you're going to invest in the U.S. stock market or in some stock market. Yes. You're going to invest in U.S. real estate. That is creating a massive, massive liquidity wave uh, across the planet. That, that's a great point, yes. So I've, I've told everybody, I, I, I said, back up the truck and buy assets. Right. You know, um, all assets. He's which assets? All yeah, assets. everything. <laughs> Every asset is, is going up. And, you know, all the latest stimulus packages, all that liquidity is going into. Oh, yes. And, Big you know, time. so in the past, you know, easy money policies have produced high inflation. And that's why they end up, you know, raising interest rates to cool the market down. Today, and if you look what happened, they printed $3.7 trillion in, in money in 2008, 9, 10 timeframe, the Federal Reserve did, and purchased notes, and it did not cause hyperinflation. Okay, but it did actually cause inflation, but not consumer price inflation. Let's divide no. inflation yes. into two, two pieces. Consumer okay. price inflation and asset price inflation. Yes. And guess what? It caused, didn't cause consumer price inflation, and it, and yeah. it will not anymore as well. No, nope. it did cause asset price inflation, which is called homes and stock market going up. We like asset price inflation. Right, right. And, yeah, and, and that's, that's another yeah, great point, because as consumers, and when people talk about inflation, they always look at CPI, right? Consumer yes. price. And they don't look at asset price inflation. Right. And I, I keep telling them that is inflation. You just don't want to see it. It's good. <laughs> It's inflation that but everybody good. loves, and let's have more of it. And yeah. and unfortunately, you know, people say, "Why are the rich becoming richer and the poor becoming poor?" Well, it's really simple. It's because asset price inflation. The rich people own assets, and the poor yeah. people don't. they are and buying assets. That's, yeah, that's the issue. And guess what? The policies today are going to continue that trend. Yes. Why aren't we? Why aren't we seeing this go into consumer price inflation? Well, here's here's the big three: you know, wages, energy, and food. Mm. that drive consumer prices, wages, energy, and food. Are wages going to go up dramatically? Well, no. Why? Globalization, automation, yeah. right? Energy prices. Are energy prices going up dramatically? No. No. Why, why not? Well, one, conservation is working. If, if you look at consumption is nearly flatlined in the Western world, believe it or not, yeah. and energy, oil prices. And production is is record breaking. Do you know who the yes. largest oil producer in the world is today? Who? Saudi Arabia? Yeah, yeah, US is, is... The United States, the world's yeah. largest. Yeah, it's not even the yeah, it doesn't need Why to even that? import. Fracking. <laughs> so, yeah. so Alpesh, what happens when Saudi Arabia starts fracking? What happens when Saudi Arabia? Oh, fracking? yeah, yeah. We've, we've, we've seen the end of $100 oil. We will never, ever see it again in our lifetimes. You know, and food, we have the same thing. We have, you know, the, the production per hectare of food is, is at an all time high and it continues because of biotechnology advances. But bottom line is we have systemic deflationary pressures in all of consumer prices, except the housing component of CPI, you know, and that's tied, that's tied to rents, which are capped. So, so it, it's very limited. CPI is just gonna be tame for a while. And bottom line is, with that, with CPI tame, they're free to keep rates 
at the floor. Yep. Yep. And so get ready, party on, and uh, <laughs> back up the truck and buy assets. Okay, let's take a quick break. <laughs> Welcome back to Wealth Matters Podcast. I am chatting with Bob Fraser regarding being a landlord and how you can control uh, being a bank. So, uh, Bob, are you ready for the five round? Let's do it. Okay, let's go. Would you be changing any business or investment strategy after coronavirus? Uh, no, we were uh, pleasantly, you know, uh, uh, pleased with with our with our performance through COVID, it continues to do just fine. And and if anything, we have more interest in our models and our strategies right now, and they're proven to be working. That's great. Favorite real estate or finance or any other related book? Um, you know, I've recommended quite a lot uh, to people. The E Myth. Uh, oh yes, is really about being on, entrepreneurial and a great book. No, E Myth's great. Yeah, I love that book. Uh, any tool or website you recommend or you can't live without? Yeah, absolutely. And this this may be more more the nerd in me, but uh, I'm a I'm an analytical machine. I love analyzing everything. And the tool I use is Microsoft Power BI, Power Business. Oh Power. yes, it is crazy. It I've is for the nerds. Yep. <laughs> it, it, I'm tied into all of my data on spreadsheets oh. on banking, and on, and so I can see returns. I, I see returns over time. I know, I know legal costs by property. I know how much each fund, each uh, different source is making us. So I just run analytics like crazy. And so all the KPIs. Uh, all the KPIs. And it's, it's <laughs> super, it's almost free and yes, it's that's an incredibly powerful tool. Oh, thank you for sharing. Any advice for beginner investors? Yeah, do your homework. It's better to find someone who has gone before you in this, and so don't you don't make the mistakes that uh, other people make because there's a lot of there's a lot of lot of pitfalls. Right. Any uh, and how do you give back? Well, I do. I do have a little group in my home. We meet once a month of entrepreneurs and reformers who are, who you know want to change business practices for the better. And so we meet once a month with young entrepreneurs and it's a lot of fun. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Bob. I had fun chatting with you. How can my listeners reach out to you? Uh, Aspen funds, F U N D S dot U S Aspen funds dot U S. Okay. I'll put that in the show note. Thank you, Bob. Take care. All right. Pleasure to be with you. Have a good one. You too.